What does General George Armstrong Custer, Gustav Whitehead, and the Wright brothers have in common? On the face of it, nothing. But this story ties them all together. General George Armstrong Custer was the great granduncle of the person who's the subject of this video. He served in the Civil War and he died at the Battle of Little Bighorn in June of 1876. Gustav Whitehead and the Wright brothers both claim to be first in flight with heavier than air aircraft. Although Whitehead claims he did it just over two years prior to the Wright brothers. And there is some evidence of this, but that's for another video. This video has to do with an unusual airplane. Willard Ray Custer was born in June 1899 in Watersfordburg, Pennsylvania, and died December 1985 in Hagerstown, Maryland. Custer was a mechanic and aircraft builder with an unusual idea. In the 1920s, Custer witnessed a barn roof getting blown loose and fly away. He always remembered that and went on to experiment with a variety of designs until he settled on the channel wing configuration. You see, Custer was interested in what we now call stole airplanes, short takeoff and landing. There were a number of stole airplanes existing at the time, Germany's Fiesler Storch, Britain's Westland Lysander, and America's Stinson Sentinel, to name a few. All good airplanes for what they were, short takeoff and landing. Custer thought he had a better idea. So he developed a series of channel wing airplanes. They were the CCW-1 through CCW-5, CCW standing for Custer Channel Wing. The CCW-1 was powered by two 75 horsepower engines driving six foot diameter pusher propellers and flew for the first time on 12 November 1942. Custer calculated that the channels produced much more lift than a straight wing section. The result was that the CCW-1 possessed outstanding short field takeoff and slow flying performance. Although it could not actually hover, it did demonstrate the ability to take off vertically in a moderate breeze. The aircraft was originally flown with the conventional wing surfaces outboard of the channels, but as the testing went on, the wings were progressively dropped to prove that it could fly perfectly well without them. The CCW-1 was successfully test flown for more than 300 hours. In 1943, Custer demonstrated the CCW-1 in Beltsville, Maryland to U.S. Army Brigadier General W.E. Gilmore, who recommended that the Army Air Corps institute a test program. During the next few years, the Army conducted a series of tests on both the aircraft itself and on the wind tunnel models. In 1947, however, the newly reorganized U.S. Air Force discontinued its investigation into the channel wing concept. In the post-war period, the Air Force simply lacked the funds for research into unconventional stole aircraft. Also, let's face it, the Air Force was interested in fast airplanes. Slow airplanes, not so much. Undeterred, Custer continued experimenting on his own and promoting his wing design. In 1947, he managed to get the CCW-1 featured on the cover of Popular Mechanics. Although Custer failed to attract support from the mainstream aviation industry, he did acquire sufficient financial backing to build a series of increasingly ambitious prototypes. Folks, in my 30 plus years of aircraft engineering, I've seen one thing for sure. If your project makes it to the cover of Popular Mechanics, that's the kiss of death, one way or another. I've seen it happen. The ultimate development of Custer's channel wing principle was the CCW-5 a modern looking twin engine airplane with a five seat enclosed cabin. Using the fuselage and tail surfaces of the uncompleted third production Bauman B-250 Brigadier, a twin engine cabin monoplane, Custer produced his CCW-5 by replacing the Bauman's conventional wings with a set of his own channel wing surfaces. The conversion was facilitated by the fact that the B-250 had originally been designed with mid-mounted wings and pusher propellers. Powered by a pair of 260 horsepower Continental engines arranged as pushers, the CCW-5 had a wingspan of 41 feet 2 inches and a length of 28 feet 8.5 inches. It weighed 3,674 pounds empty 
and it had a normal loaded weight of 4,925 pounds. The base airplane, on the other hand, the Bauman B-250 Brigadier, had an empty weight of 2,200 pounds and a gross weight of 3,500 pounds. Clearly, the CCW-5 had a weight issue. First flown in July of 1953, the CCW-5 proved successful aerodynamically. Although the structural and mechanical complexity of the channel wings made the CCW-5 heavier than the original Bauman, it could take off in three seconds after a 100-foot roll and fly controllably at speeds between 22 and 200 miles an hour. In addition, it could make steeply banked turns at speeds so low that any other airplane would stall and crash. When the channel wings did stall, their stalling characteristics were described as gentle and viceless. The CCW-5's performance was considered all the more remarkable because, in contrast to other stall aircraft, the Custer's wings possessed no flaps, slots, or other airfoil modifying devices. Throughout the 1950s, Custer tried unsuccessfully to sell his idea to a variety of aircraft manufacturers. Some insight into the reason for his lack of success may be gleaned from Pete Deanna, a former executive with Goodyear Aircraft Corporation, who in an interview recounted a series of meetings he conducted with Custer in 1956 with a view to acquiring his channeling technology for Goodyear. Deanna described Custer as a smooth-talking salesman with a good grasp of aeronautics, but a lousy habit of not providing data beyond small reports, photos, and brochures he used while trying to sell the designs. Undeterred, in 1964, Custer finally managed to attract sufficient financial backing to establish his own company for the manufacture of the Custer channel wings. The firm soon folded, however, after completing just one production CCW-5. Remember I told you about the cover of Popular Mechanics? Here's the cover for September of 64. Despite the demonstrated aerodynamic efficiency of the CCW-5's design and decades of promotional effort on part of Willard Custer and his son Harold, the channel wing idea never managed to gain acceptance from the mainstream aviation industry. Some have speculated that its failure was due as much to the inventor's personality as it was to any inefficiency in the design itself. Perhaps Custer would have been taken more seriously if he had been a member of the design staff of one of the major aircraft corporations such as Douglas, Boeing, or Lockheed. He was always a rank outsider in the aviation design community, an empirical inventor with a penchant for what nowadays is called thinking outside the box. Although Willard Custer died in 1985, the channel wing story did not end with him. Two of the Custer's channel wing aircraft survived. The original CCW-1 resides at the National Air and Space Museum's Paul Garber facility in Suitland, Maryland, and the sole CCW-5 is currently at the Mid-Atlantic Air Museum in Reading, Pennsylvania. Oh, a panel, we have a little piece of motion picture film here, which will give you some idea of how this plane looks in action, just so you won't think we're kidding you here, and we'll take a look at the film right now. How fast are you going now when you take off on this? Take it off at 20 miles an hour. And it's going to make a lot of people want to fly, isn't oh, it? Oh, yes. Uh, we take a tremendous amount of inquiries for this because of the slow flight. How high can it go? Oh, high as any aircraft. Now, it's flying at 11 miles per hour there when it was hovering. Wow. And this comes in and lands at 20 miles an hour, depending on the atmospheric pressure. We have had a man run along beside this aircraft and hold to it while it's flying. Hmm. It flies that slow. I see. The Custer Channel Wing. From an aerodynamic perspective, very good airplane for stole applications. However, that's not the be-all end-all. Um, mechanically, structurally, it's just not there. It's, it's hard to build, it's structurally inefficient, it's expensive. So it never did make it as a commercial success. You gotta have a, a, a wide variety of good features on an airplane that it does fairly well in order to be successful. The channel wing was one trick pony. That is why this is a bit of history you probably didn't know.